Hello, and welcome back to the RPE Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Connor, and I'll be joined by Stephen Dan. The RPE Podcast is a show dedicated to talking about training, rehabilitation, and sports medicine in the musculoskeletal setting. This show is for all healthcare providers, including new and experienced strength and conditioning coaches, physiotherapists, exercise physiologists, and also students of any allied health profession who are interested in rehab and management of athletes and the general population. On the show, we aim to try and make sense of all of the evidence and present it in an easy and practical way that tries to bridge the gaps in each of our respective knowledge bases. We enjoy staying up to date with the evidence base, and as a result, we find new information all the time that we will look to pass on to you. One last thing, the views and opinions on this show are our own, and should not be taken as healthcare advice. We hope you enjoy the show. All right, guys, welcome back to the RPE podcast. So this is series one, episode two. We're continually talking about the programming principles. Hopefully today we'll put it a little bit more into action. So again, my name is Steve Collins from the Joint Physiotherapy in Nunda. Um, Got Dan down there. Dan, just introduce yourself again quickly. Yeah, I'm Dan Exentaris from Play. Cool. And Connor? Hi, I'm Connor Park. I work out at Physio Taz in Devonport, Tasmania. Awesome. And all of us have a uh, big interest in exercise prescription and helping uh, new and, and upcoming uh, professionals get, get the best out of this. So. Last week, we left off with uh, chatting about the SRA cycle and the envelope of function and how it affects our programming aims. Uh, Last time, we said that we were going to delve some deeper into RPE, which is rating and perceived exertion or auto-regulated programming. Uh, That's just a way to make sure that we're applying the correct stress for the situation that's in front of us. Uh, We will delve deeper into this programming principle soon, but first, we're going to delve deeper into other... um, things involved in programming like variability, specificity, and how this relates to the programming goals. Um, This could be very interesting chat as I'm sure each of us has a unique experience around this. We'll be then covering some other basic things like sets and reps, which is the bread and butter of programming. Um, And then Dan will finally get to blow our minds with some of his knowledge and the evidence and his experience around RPE and auto-regulated programming, which is something that we've chatted lots about in the past and something that uh, has definitely opened my eyes on and that I use now a lot because of that. Um, So hopefully we'll get to some case study examples at the end as well. So ready to go guys? Nice. Starting off, so variability, specificity, goal setting, all that type of stuff. So um, I think the underlying thing here is the specific adaptations to imposed demands principle, so the said principle. So um, basically, whenever you have someone coming, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a um, general pop, a first time seeing a rehab client, you have to outline, I guess, what you're attempting to get out of this, which then kind of, I guess, sets out whether or not or how specific you need to be, how much variation um, you're needing. And, and I always see this as a spectrum. So with specificity being right on one end, being like the task that you are getting them to do. So say an uh, older deconditioned person coming in, they need to get better at getting, say, up and down off the couch. Well, specific to that task is getting up and down off the couch is the most specific. Whereas variability might be something, another exercise that's involving strengthening the quadriceps, like you know, step ups or leg extensions or something. So I just see it as all of on a spectrum as far as how close it looks biomechanically, bioenergetically, etc., to the task that they're wanting to complete. Same as with injury. So um, specifically, I guess, to the tissue that you're having to rehab versus kind of doing other variable movement tasks that are going to promote, I guess, things like your motor learning and and those type of things as well, which also play into rehab, but isn't as specific to tasks. So you can, you you sort of don't want to fall into the trap, I guess, too much of of just over, of being like specificity is king. Um, It it is dependent on the, I guess, if you're talking about a rehab client, depends on where they're at in their stage of rehab. If you're talking about an athlete, 
or if you're doing a team, if you're in a team sport, their sport is the most specific thing that you can do. So if you're trying to train them to get better at, say, soccer, getting better at soccer is going to make them better. Yeah. All the other stuff is secondary to that. So, yeah, I think if we can get, you can't get caught up too much in specificity, but then, yeah, like you're saying, it's, it is a spectrum. You know, I agree with that. Cool. Connor, any main kind of just a starting kind of point on specificity, variability? And I'm going to put in there as well transferability, but I'll talk about that in a second. Yep. Yeah, that, that was going to be one of the main things that I was going to mention, especially from physio point of view, like that you can have the task in mind, which might be, like you said, a sit to stand, but if they don't have the capacity to do it, you change different variables or you add some variability to your training to allow them to build the capacity to do the specific task. They're not going to be able to, the most specific thing for a sit to stand, like you said, is a sit to stand, but if they can't do it, then you've got to, you've got to do everything else around it. And then yeah. hopefully that kind of transfers. I kind of see that as well as being, um, I guess that's still going specificity. So say they don't, they lack the strength or whatever to do the task. Well then your objective, you have to do an objective measure. Same as like in a, in a high performance thing, if they lack whatever to do the task, well then you still kind of, it's still on the specificity end of the spectrum because you have specifically identified that they are lacking, you know, x and so you're going to kind of target that but then put that you're just targeting the specificity of the adaptation that you're after so you know all things still have to i guess go along that specificity uh, of the imposed demand so you're going to adapt to the demands that you place on it you know so that's the general basis of that principle is if you're doing leg extensions your quads are going to get bigger kind of thing i guess like so you know, whatever whatever it is that you're training for or whatever it is that you're training, um, I guess that's what your body is going to adapt to. It's only going to be so generalizable. Um, so, you know, squatting for training for squatting five reps, you're going to get your best bang for buck return for adaptations in that five rep range and you'll get a little bit less adaptation in one rep range a little bit less down that 20 rep range kind of your you know that's that i guess it being specific to the actual task that you are that you're doing there um the other thing i'd said transferability though um i think that's really important because that comes into programming as to be like okay as dan said a soccer player we're not just going to send a soccer player a soccer player out to do three sets of 20 play soccer kind of thing like it, that's not how you you program so you are trying to do things tasks that are similar enough are involving the the musculature that are involving the um same energy systems to that they're going to be stressed in their task um and transferring that into the into the weight room in a way that is trainable progressive uh, progressively so that you can progressively make sure that they're they're getting towards their goal i guess yeah yeah i agree yeah um and, and pretty much everything that you want to be doing in the right room in, in the weight room sorry you'd wanted that to be transferable to any given sport or application that you're training your client or athlete so you don't really want to give them something that is not necessarily unless it's just a feel good thing but yeah you know Everything you do should be in, in the aid of transferring to the to the realm that you're coaching. Well, we were talking about this yesterday, Connor. It was the whole. Um, there was a, I think, someone um, rehabbing a UCL, so a, a mm. lateral ligament in the in the elbow thing, and he was yep. doing some like little resisted um, throwing kind of motion, and we were saying, you know, yes, that's that's nice. It, looks very specific to the task but it's never going to be loaded enough that you're going to be able to progress it up that it's going to be transferable to actually the demands of, of throwing a baseball like it, it shouldn't be yeah. the bread and butter of of the programming so just generally building that system's capacity should be the bread and butter and then the really really specific things should be either left to playing the sport or just doing little bits of um, to make either the athlete 
feel good if there's a little specific goal involved with that task, but that shouldn't be like the, the bread and butter of our kind of programming, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So would you say goal setting here, I guess, is the to, to choose how specific or how variable you want to be along this spectrum. Goal setting is kind of the, the main thing that you do at the start here. Yeah, I think I think you've got to have you've got to have good goals. You've got to have smart goals essentially, um, yep. because it it guides your training for what you want to do. Like if you if you need to get a specific adaptation out of something, you need to give it a specific stimulus, um, and you need to know what you're trying to work towards. So having having that goal is yeah probably the most important thing to start out with before you even get into anything else. And it's that goal being meaningful to I guess both the, the client to, or the, the um, athlete or the person doing their rehab, but then also sometimes, unfortunately, the goal in, in rehab scenarios is going to be, I need this tissue to achieve X, Y, Z. You know what I mean? And that's, it is hard to make that um, a very patient-centered goal drive thing. But, you know, there, there should always be the patient's or the, the athlete's long-term goal there. But, I mean your program always must be targeting, I guess, the, the goal of either it's a ex every exercise will have a specific goal or your overall program will have that specific goal in, in mind that then you decide where along this specificity versus kind of variability or transferability um, platform we, we're going to sit on. Um, I guess I, I just had one, one point, which is, probably, which is probably a good one to make, would be uh, just managing the expectations of, of who you're training. So if they've come to you with a goal or they want to do something, you've got to manage the expectations about A, how long it takes, B, in rel relatively to where they're at and what they're capable of. Um, and then that way along the way, so if you're doing, if you're doing a specific exercise or you're in a training block, that's not going to give them the result yet. You've got to manage their expectations to know that long term, we're working towards X. Yeah. So we can't yeah, go from zero to a hundred. So I think managing expectations is a part of the goal setting and, and um, the specificity variability. 100%, because that's, I guess the, um, that expectations thing is, that's couched in your initial or your ongoing objective kind of markers, measures as we're going. So you're always continually testing testing these things as we go to make sure um, that, yeah, your everyone's goals are uh, meeting or that your goals and your client's goals are kind of, or and your patient's goals are the same thing because that's a big place where programming can, can kind of go downhill as if your goals and your patient or athletes or client's goals don't kind of meet. Um, you know, if you're here really, really worried about in rehab say if you're really really worried about x tissue like whatever it is say um you know the patellofemoral joint or something you're really 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 worried about kind of just rehabbing towards that but you know they really don't care about a lot of the tasks that are involved in there well then you're going to i guess straight away run into run into some issues so that's a really good point there dan yeah because as a as a as you said if if your expectations are here and you're and they're cruising along real nicely, you're real happy with their progress, but their expectations are here, they they're either gonna leave before they're actually rehabilitated or they're just not gonna be bought into what you're doing. Yep. So if you can sort of manage them down to where your where your actual level is, um, I think the the success will be a lot well the, the rehab will be a lot smoother process for them because it, it can be Managing the expectations, especially during an injury rehab, is could be quite difficult to dealing with all the mental and emotional, and psychological issues along with the physical. Yeah, that's right. Well, and I think the the greatest examples of that are your long term rehab. So, like your your ACLs, those type of things, are the really really good examples of that. Um, and so it is bringing in something almost right from the very start. Going, you know, this is this is something that you really enjoy. I almost like to give people a little bit of um. I guess this is going a little bit more into the psychology of stuff, but I always, to make sure that we are managing expectations there, I think I always love to 
to give them, you know, well, this is this is what to expect. So that way it's not, I guess, um, breaking their expectations. So that way we're, we're set on the same level. This is what to expect. Um, you know, we're going to give you some autonomy or some ownership over this as well. So you feel like you can kind of control some of the situation. Uh, we're going to try to bring in some things that you enjoy where possible because rehab can be a, an annoying long thing. So one of my footy players, we're like halfway along when we we're able, able to jump. He used to be a long jumper. We're like, okay, we're going to start to bring in just a random thing. There's no real need. I wouldn't, most people program long jump into their ACL rehab, but we just started doing long jump because I knew that it was going to keep him kind of bought into it. And no, that's not specific to him getting better at a rug, rugby league game, but it's going to be transferable. A lot of those tasks that he's going to learn along the way through, um, you know, creating and absorbing force through that knee in a task that he really enjoyed, like long jump, um, which was something that we were going to be able to bring in before we're going to bring in like a lot of explosive rugby league movements um, was something that was going to get him to buy into that program. So that's where I guess you, you need to know your specificity at this end to go, this is what this joint, this is what this person has to be able to achieve. You have to know their expectations, the things that they really enjoy, the things that they're going to buy into it and find that somewhere in the middle that is going to allow them to, I guess, stay the course. Yeah, which is all, which is all that art and science that we have already spoken about, which That's comes right. with, unfortunately, comes with seeing many clients and many athletes and, yeah. Yeah, that's right. All right, so I reckon we chat some of the more boring kind of bread and butter stuff, just get it out of the way and done. So set, rep, um, volume, volume load, all that type of stuff. So... Um, Connor, do you want to outline kind of what a what a set is, what a rep is, um, what we're trying to achieve with this at all? Yep. Okay. So a rep is short for repetition, so meaning doing one task x amount of times. So whether it be a bicep curl, one repetition is one bicep curl. Ten reps is doing the same thing ten times, no different for sprints, squats, anything like that. And a yeah. set is a grouping of the repetitions. So you're going to do three sets of 10, just means three lots of 10 repetitions with a bit of rest in between. Had to go um, to classic three sets of 10, didn't you? Well, it's very common. So, yeah, and a lot, of people, a lot of people hear it and they identify with it. And they've, most people, if they've been to a, a physio or a trainer of some sort, they've probably done three sets of 10 of something. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with three sets of 10 as long as it's, as long as it's, as long as it's specific to their goal. That's right, exactly. Yeah. And it reaches yeah. the correct intensity. So, no, and you brought up an awesome point there that it's not only our gym work that you prescribe in sets and reps. So, you know, conditioning. Um, even, like, personally, over this lockdown kind of period, I was learning things like handstands and, um, and cartwheels, that type of stuff. And, like, your motor learning theories, so these um, constraint-induced movement, um, kind of theories, your dynamic system theories, that's all just based on repetition, sets of repetitions. They call it frequency, but it's basically the amount of times that you can do something in the environment, repeated, 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 you're going to get better at that task. So um, yeah, everything that you program, if you want to get good at it, basically programming sets, programming reps. Um, so yeah, what are we what are we trying to achieve with our prescription of sets and reps, Dan? Uh, I guess it depends on depends on what you're doing. Like you were saying, if you're doing a skill based movement, then I guess you're getting comfortable performing that movement. If you're doing conditioning blocks, then you're trying to get a certain amount of volume of running or or what have you in. And obviously, the same the same for strength training. You, you want to get a certain amount of volume or say sets times reps times load into yeah, that's whatever you're the training. Um, then that the sets and the reps just carry the load. So I think mean, they're all they're all reps and the load are sort of related in terms of and we'll talk about this later, how I specify what reps I want depends on how heavy I want the weight. Yep. Um, 
yeah, doing uh, 5% sort of set. I know what sort of rep scheme I want with that. And then however many sets depends on how, how, how much load I want to actually have in the session. I think the big thing that you brought in there that brings it back to the SRA cycle, brings it back to the envelope of function is what is a set, what's a rep, how much volume all relates on how much you intend it to disrupt the, the regular homeostasis of the SRA cycle. So a lot of skill based stuff, I'll be programming like, you know, 30 sets of two or something like it's, it's not a lot. It's very, very rare in my weights prescription that I would ever prescribe something like that because I just know that this skill learning to do a cartwheel or learning to do a handstand or learning to kick a ball or something like that is not going to be a big disruption to the homeostasis to create a big stress that they're going to have to recover from. So I know that, you know, I can program an absolute crap load of that stuff and it not really be um, affecting that SRA cycle. And that's more affecting kind of motor learning, getting neural kind of drive, getting neural repetitions, the connection from the brain out to the periphery of how to actually move the body in space. And that there takes a lot more sets and reps than, um, you know, I'd never program things that I know are going to be a big disruption in, in the homeostasis or create a big magnitude of stress or push that tissue towards its envelope of function um, with such high volumes, which is sets by reps by intensity. So the, it, a lot of it is intensity driven as to, you know, how many sets or reps something is going to um, need. So yeah, your sets and reps are always, I guess, just based on whatever you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a motor learning thing, a lot higher volume sets reps at a very low kind of, well, very low physical intensity. They could actually be using a lot, a lot of their effort, like a, you know, when you're learning to do a handstand or a cartwheel or something or kick a ball, you're trying to kick it pretty hard. Like that's a 10 out of 10 effort, but realistically, it lasts for such a short time. So it's duration of the stress is so low that the magnitude of that total stress is going to be low. So yeah. I think this molds really well into your topic of expertise, Dan, because we've just said basically that if it's something that's not going to be disrupting that homeostasis a lot, which is that based on intensity, um, well then, you know, that, decides how much we need of sets or reps or volume. So if you want to talk through kind of intensity and, and blow our mind for a little bit here, and then uh, we'll chime in as needed. So um, yeah, go through your, you know, the what is it, um, the stuff that we monitor, measure, um, and then yeah, auto regulation stuff, because I know that you, you love that. So, and if you've got some stuff to share up, feel free as we go. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen uh, in a second just with a couple of, of nice tables where you can tie in a percent a percentage of, of 1RM versus what an RPE or rate of perceived exertion, what the comparison is. Lately, I've been sort of steering away from like RPE in terms of how I want it because I kind of want to go, what, you, what, what did you rate your performance? Yep. So I know just frame in a different way so that if we're talking about RPE and they've exerted a lot, sometimes they may go, I had one rep left, like well, you, you might have had, and they might have looked like they had three or four, but to them it was a nine or I had one rep left. So yep. trying to rate their performance and how much, how many reps they had in, left in reserve and um, try and get them in the mind space of thinking performance. Yep. Okay. So I want to sort of cover the, 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 the RPE sort of scale that you might see as well, which is the ball rating, which we can use for session session loading or training loads. Just want to make it clear that that's not the table that I use in, in the weight room. So yeah, this is not what I do either. Yeah, for, for assessing training loads as a quick measure or as a reliable measure where you don't have GPS data or you don't have any other metrics to, to use. Um, just want to sort of make that, that clear. But, um, so just just quickly, you said that that is 
say if you're getting someone to rate their session RPE because as as we we're saying that is something that can be uh, we were having a chat about this off off the podcast but that can be something that can be useful to track so you were saying that's the one that you w- will use to rate their session RPE yeah actually good good point in that if we're talking in the case of we're talking sets reps and whatnot in, in a conditioning sense or out in the field we're doing conditioning I can't ask them to go up E8 for me. I can't ask them to give me two left in the yep. tank. They must complete the work that, I, that that what they're capable of. And then post-session, we'll ask them to rate how hard that effort of session was out of 10 using this scale, a visual scale. Multiply that by the duration of the session. And that gives us arbitrary training units or the training load. Yep. And therefore, that's when we sort of monitor over time the required load that we're getting in. And as as you were saying, this it's something that we used to... I know I, I was using it originally when Gabbett's work came out, um, a lot of the, the acute to chronic stuff, I was using it to make a lot of decisions based on, like, you know, the whole got to keep in the golden ratio, the... 0.8 to 1.2 or even up to people saying 1.5 at some stage um, was where you could push it to where basically people were just rating how hard a session felt, you know, over that one session and then had that, you know, the average of how hard their sessions have felt over the last couple of weeks and dividing them gave you a number. And if it sat within that range, we were all happy. If it didn't, then we were going, oh, the next session we might go down. Um, I don't really do that as much. Well, I don't do that at all um, now as the evidence has kind of gone away from that. Um, so what's, yeah, your take on that, I guess? Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I don't I don't like to pull people out of sessions based on, based on yeah, that, those metrics. Um, yep. It might be a good conversation starter or... It, it might be like just to go, okay, they've had a really hard session yesterday. Today, you're not going to go back to that heavy session. You might moderate that a little bit more. 100%. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, and I think, and I think that's, that's sort of been brought up is that you don't, you don't want to sort of be pulling too many people out of session. I know it was a bit popular at one stage to, to start sitting people out, but you just want to try and get as much work in them as possible and maintain that capacity. And, and realistically, like we're a lot more adaptable and whatever that, uh, than we were giving, I guess, robust than, than that ratio was giving credit for. Um, so like, like uh, and physios were using it in clinic as well to help prescribe like running loads or anything. And it wasn't a bad place to start. Um, but I think you always have to, it had to be couched in performance metrics as well. So, you know, if their sessions, their rating, every session has been really hard, it's gone for a really long time. So you're seeing that's your proxy for fatigue is going up and their performance is going down. That then might be a time to kind of think about changing changing your, your programming. But until then, I guess you've got to, keep an eye on things but know that humans are a bit more robust than probably that gave it credit for yeah and i think i think you got to know where you are in your training program so if you're if you're at a stage where you're either picking someone for competition you're in a really hard training block you know it's going to be hard mm. you can't stop it like you can't otherwise you're going to sort of lose a bit of that adaptation which you're trying to get yeah. So you you want to be mindful of everything, but I don't, I don't you don't you don't want to sort of be erring on the side of pulling out of, of, of sessions or or reducing load for unnecessary purposes. If they if they come to you and go, look, I'm really fried. Maybe you might pull a, a little bit of volume out or a, or a little bit of intensity out, but. Um, you got to, I guess that, that and then and you, you know, you, you got to know your client or athlete to, to be able to make that decision. Yep. All right. No, thanks. I just thought we'd clarify that one. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's that one. This one is taken from <clears throat> table 
uh, is actually a study by Eric Helms, and I can't remember the other authors, but this table was uh, also taken from Mike Zordos. He's, a, he's another really good, uh, I think he's a professor in Florida. He, he has done a lot in periodization. Mm -hmm. This is the table, or this is a table in which I look at in terms of getting a gauge for how many repetitions I'm performing. And this one goes up to eight. You can go higher, but this, this one goes up to eight. And what the RP is and the relative sort of intensity is to one RM. So when, we, when I talk about intensity, I just talk about percentage of one RM. Yep. This, so if I'm, if I'm asking someone, and if, if I'm asking someone to give me, say, five reps at an RP, or I say I give them five reps at 81%, or 80%. In my head, I'm thinking, should be comfortable enough to have at least two more in the tank. They shouldn't be anywhere near redlining. For whatever reason that day, they've had a fight with their partner, they've had a hard day at work. They actually can only get maybe five reps where they're really redlining on that last one. So it gives you a good idea to know how, long, how much capacity they should have or how many they should have in the tank and then what you're seeing in front of them is what you're seeing in front of you is is what's actually happening so you've got to be able to gauge it on the fly so, so that's you, a, really good, a really good table just to just to give a starting point and give a good relationship with say that example comes up where you know you had programmed someone to you know that rat, the weight that they had on the bar should have roughly had them at you know an RPE eight and a half um, performing five reps, so you know you had about eighty two percent on the on the bar kind of thing there. Um, but they yeah you know they get to it, do the warm ups, they're feeling okay, but then yes, then had all this other life stress involved that you throw eighty two percent on the bar, they lift and you know it floors them at three. At three they you know. They've got the bar up, they've got the weight up, it looked okay, wasn't the prettiest, but you've gone, nah, what, what's then your kind of go-to to make sure again, because we're going back to that stress recovery adaptation, you're not wanting to be applying this massive magnitude of stress because obviously you've realised that, you know, all that stuff has played into the performance of today. What, what do you do to make sure that, you are implying that the intended stimulus that you actually wanted to apply onto your athlete there. So if, if they're in that situation, if it wasn't just a, and, and just a weird sort of technical failure where they sort of got a bit off balance, they hit the rack, something happened and they truly didn't perform to where I thought I would just reduce the load on the bar to sit within the rep scheme that I wanted for that day. Yep. Um, if on the other hand they performed the five reps and they were absolutely cooked, I'd go, sweet, we're done. And you might either do one back offset or you might do none. It depends on how I felt they they went. Or if they got if they got what I thought that I wanted to achieve out of that session, then I'm good. Yep. Because um, I guess in yeah. using in using this, like and I think we'll continue this chat on um, in a second after after our time runs out. But um, so we'll, we'll continue this chat on. But I think basically it's just a way that you are making sure that you know you've used your sets, your reps, to know that this is the volume that you're wanting of stress to apply to the organism, and this is your way of knowing that that magnitude is going to be the magnitude that you want it to apply. So that way, when they come back to you the next day, you know why they're feeling, you know, if they're feeling on top of the world, they've adapted, or not the next day, the next session, if they're feeling on top of the world, they've adapted to things well, you know that your prescription was on point or that, you know, if this is the goal of the program at the time to make them feel better each time um, and, and improve performance you know that your magnitude was on point. Um, if they've come back and they're absolutely fried, you know that, okay, I can just adjust this RPE or I can adjust volume or something like that. But, you know, you can adjust 
this to make sure that next time you're applying the correct stimulus. Yeah, and it's like it's always on a spectrum. So if you want, if you're a five rep target, I might give them a range as well because they might feel really good on the day, and and it depends on who they are, and I'll leave it up to them. You might give them a range where seventy nine to eighty four percent, give them a five percent buffer. Because eighty four percent on that day might feel like seventy nine percent because they might be feeling really good, really recovered, really fresh. Yeah, and vice versa. So it just it just gives a good. You don't have to prescribe RPE. That's just for you. Yeah, to know that that you know that yes, if we're doing a one rep max, I know they shouldn't do any more than that. Yes, but so, I don't want them doing five rep max if I don't want them doing a five rep max. Okay, so this is a really big and interesting topic that Dan and Steve are enjoying talking about. So we'll cut this episode there for ease of digestion. Don't worry though, the talk continues from where we left off in the next episode. To recap episode two, we started out talking about the SED principle. SED stands for Specific Adaptation to Imposed Demand, which simply means the body will adapt to and deal with the stress placed on it in a way that is specific to what it experienced. For, for instance, like Dan said, playing soccer is going to be the best way to improve at soccer, not by swimming or running or dart throwing. Following the SED principle, we talked about variability versus specificity and outlined that it was more of a spectrum rather than two black and white principles of training. Variability is useful when you need to alter the stress placed on a body part, whether it be range of motion, tempo, exercise selection, or even cross training. However, we still want that activity to be specific enough to the person's goals to get some transfer or carryover. For instance, increasing the capacity of someone's quad with step ups, split squats, or leg extensions will transfer in some amount over to squatting, even though Squatting is the most specific thing to improve squatting. A very important part of today's show was when we were discussing goal setting. Goal setting underpins all programming as it guides you and informs you as to what set and rep scheme you might use, the frequency, intensity, or the type of exercise you might include in your program. It also helps us to gauge the person's expectations, which is a really important issue to address, as it can help them understand what training or rehab will look like and also give realistic timeframes or deadlines and outcomes for their training. We then moved into our sets and repetitions, what they mean and how we may manipulate them for certain goals. There will be more on this next episode. Skill-based movements often require low physical demand, but most often will take many repetitions to improve. Steve gave the examples of handstands or kicking. They don't add much stress to the body, even though they are done at maximum intensity. You could say the same for learning a language. Initially, you will pick up words and learn things relatively quickly, but it takes lots and lots of repetition to be fluent to the point where you eventually have to be immersed in that language to improve. That is fine for skill-based things, but this is not the case for strength or conditioning tasks. As the intensity is much higher and the stress placed on the body will take much longer to recover from. For example, speaking Spanish all day will be beneficial for speaking Spanish, but squatting all day will not benefit squatting. The final thing we talked about today and where we'll pick up from in episode three is how to measure, monitor and manage intensity. Here on the RPE podcast, we are a fan of using RPE or rate of perceived exertion to quantify intensity. So Dan and Steve have a lot to discuss. First, we talked about session RPE and how the classic one to 10 Borg scale is a good measure for whole session intensity, especially if you don't have access to GPS data and things like that. However, Dan and Steve use a different process to gauge intensity in the gym. This being Helms work, using a percentage of repetition maximum to help define RPE. Dan talked about how RPE 8 is the equivalent of having two RIR, or repetitions left in reserve, and how he can then use that table to prescribe how much the person can lift based on what the RPE of the exercise is and how it relates to the percentage of that person's one or three RM. For example, we know from the table that five reps at RPE 8 will be 81% of their one rep max weight. This takes into account how hard the trainee believes they are working at a set intensity and can help us more easily tailor the amount of stress we apply to a person. Everyone is different and will respond to stress in a different way, but recording their volume, which we defined as sets multiplied by reps multiplied by intensity, can be a good measure of how they are coping with the program. We will put up a link for this table in the description. Next week, we delve further into using RPE and percentages of maximum to prescribe training. We also dive further into how to ensure the athlete or client is coping, as well as giving some examples to help piece it all together. 
We suggest that if you are listening to the audio only version of the show, that you check out the tables we are referring to throughout the show, as they may be very useful in helping your understanding. There will be a link in the description below. Thanks again for listening. We had some great feedback on how to improve the show after our first podcast and are looking forward to implementing suggestions in future episodes. Keep the suggestions coming in, anything from recording quality through to content or suggestions for future episodes, as we do enjoy hearing from you. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the RPE Podcast. We hope you enjoyed grinding out another RPE 10 show with us. If you like our content, please leave us a like or a rating as it helps drive traffic to our work. We have left links to all of the resources mentioned in the description. If you are watching on YouTube, please leave a comment below or if you would like to get in contact with us, we will leave our email addresses in the description as well. See you next time on the RPE Podcast.